this edition of Grace Community Church Online. I'm Pastor David Graham of Grace Community Church in Boulder City, Nevada. So glad you could join us. Would you join me in a quick prayer as we begin our session together? Father, I thank and praise you for your faithfulness, Lord. We love you with all of our hearts. Help us now to hear your word. Help us to be encouraged and lifted up by what you plan to share with each of our hearts. Lord, we are the people of your pasture. We are your church, Lord, blood-bought, sanctified, being made ready for our eternal destiny in a recreated earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to share some announcements at this time. Uh, May 23rd is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we are not at the present time planning to have a Pentecost picnic, primarily because of the COVID restrictions, which are still in place. But we're praying that we'll soon uh, not need to be in place because uh, of the number of people who are getting vaccinated. And as part of that note, if you have not been vaccinated yet, uh, right here in town, uh, Johnson & Johnson is a one-and-done shot, and it's done at Albertson's in the pharmacy there. And uh, it's really simple. The man who administers that is the doctor of pharmacy there. And real simple just to stop by there and say, can I make an appointment or can we come in now? Especially if you come in the morning, sometimes you can just walk in and they're ready to take care of you. And it doesn't cost anything. You fill out a very minimal amount of paperwork. And then after the shot, you wait for 15 minutes to make sure that you're not dizzy or whatever. And uh, I think that's a really simple way uh, to get it done. There are, the uh, hospital is offering shots. Um, Smith Center, you can get shots. Lots of ways to get it done. But it's silly to somehow have some kind of philosophical problem with getting vaccinated. You know, if it starts raining, it's okay to use an umbrella. When it's raining a worldwide pandemic, it's okay to become vaccinated. So I encourage you, if you haven't done that, to please get that taken care of. And the sooner that we all do, the easier it will be for us to gather together again and have our fellowship time and so forth. By the way, those things are in discussion. <clears throat> our transition plans are in discussion. So it all looks promising for the immediate future. Thank you. Please join me in singing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary and guide my feet. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary
a couple of prayer praise notes actually for both Carl and Rich who are getting stronger and coming to church teaching their classes as an answer to prayer that God has been faithful once again to help us in our time of need if uh, you have a prayer need or if you're struggling or going through something don't hesitate to call the church office <clears throat> Jan is very understanding let us know how we can bless you uh, I want us to remember uh, Pam Erskine, my son Greg Graham. These are unspoken requests. Uh, God knows what they are, but would you lift them up in prayer? Um, and uh, that's all I can think of at the moment. So let's always be a people of prayer at grace, shall we? Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Now our scripture readings, the first one is in the Old Testament, Psalm 49, 1-9. Hear the word of the Lord. 
Listen to this, all you people. Pay attention, everyone in the world. High and low, rich and poor, listen. For my words are wise and my thoughts are filled with insight. Listen carefully to many proverbs and solve riddles with inspiration from a harp. Why should I fear when trouble comes, when enemies surround me? They trust in their wealth and boast of great riches, yet they cannot redeem themselves from death by paying a ransom to God. Redemption does not come so easily, for no one can ever pay enough to live forever and never see the grave. Well, that's the reading from Psalm 49, 1 through 9. And now we begin a study this week, uh, which will be several weeks long uh, in the book of Acts. As you know, this not this coming Sunday, the 16th, which you're hearing this, but the 23rd is the day of Pentecost, the day the church celebrates the coming of the third person of the triune God to remain permanently on this earth. So this is entitled The Promise of the Holy Spirit. First five verses in Acts 1. Now Luke is the author here and he had already written a gospel called the Gospel of Luke, which we're very familiar with. And now this is his follow-up letter. <clears throat> we don't know who Theophilus is, but probably a very learned friend. Remember, Luke was a Greek physician. He traveled with Paul. He wasn't one of the disciples who hung out with Jesus. But he learned all about Jesus, his ministry, his miracles, because as he traveled with Paul, Paul would go into synagogues and meet with Gentiles and explain who Jesus was and how he was among us. And Paul had also learned all of that uh, secondhand because he was also not one of those who hung out with Jesus. So they basically relied on the testimony of the twelve. And of course, there were later 70, 72 that were sent out. And again, at the upper room on the day of Pentecost, there were 120. So here's Luke now writing this letter. By the way, he is a preeminent historian. And he says, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As, as I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's our reading in the New Testament.
Now I'd like to begin our, our message today, the promise of the Holy Spirit. The outline for this message is directly from the book of Acts chapter 1. And I shared a little bit about Luke, the physician who traveled with Paul, in the introduction to the reading of the portion in Acts. And so that's where I want us to remember. Now, I begin with the words of Jesus. And I want to kind of set the tone for you a little bit. And I want you to imagine with me these disciples. There were more than just 12. Uh, we'll find out when we get to Acts chapter 2 and, and later in chapter 1, uh, there's at least 120. Now, that's not very many when we know there were approximately 4 million Jews uh, in Palestine at that time. So the percentage of those who were faithfully following Jesus was less than three hundredths of one percent, 120. Now, there were probably plenty of people who remembered his miracles and, and who were grateful for his teaching and ministry, but they were not basically the dedicated followers. <clears throat> and Jesus, in one of his appearances, because he had to reinforce in their minds that he truly was alive, that it wasn't just their imagination. He wanted them to see him eat food, physical food. He had a physical body. And at one of these times, he said, look, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you receive the gift that the Father promised. Now, we know that it is the coming of the Holy Spirit. But at that point, when he said those words, these disciples of his were just now beginning to comprehend the immensity that the itinerant rabbi that they had sworn allegiance to and who had ministered in his behalf, healing the sick people, casting out demons, and proclaiming the nearness and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God onto earth they were still kind of in this in-between state. And now he says, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the gift. And he gives a clue or a hint of what that gift might be. He said, look, remember John baptized with water for repentance and forgiveness of sins. But you are going to see, uh, you will be baptized with the baptism of Jesus in the Holy Spirit. Now, they had no idea what that was going to look like. So then shortly after he gave those instructions to stay in Jerusalem, according to Acts chapter 1, they kept asking him questions like, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This tiny piece of land, no more than 40 miles wide, 120 miles long, housing 40 or, uh, yeah, approximately uh, 4 million Jews, they had this dream that this little tribe was going to eventually rule the entire world because they were God's chosen people. And Jesus answered and said, look, the father alone knows when the kingdom will be fully established. Even the son of man talking about himself, even I don't know when that kingdom will be restored. But here's what I will tell you. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now, the first thing I want to say about that, you will receive power. The Greek word there is dunamis. And we got a word dynamite from that. It's explosive power, real power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, I want you to imagine a blanket just coming and settling over you. That's the meaning of that word. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to have supernatural power given to you. And that primary purpose of that power will be to proclaim, to share your faith, to not be fearful, to be bold, to cross the social barriers, to tell people 
that God loves them and that he has a plan for their life. And if they would simply receive him as Savior and Lord, repenting of their sins, they would have this new life that God promised. So after saying this, then we call it the ascension. He was taken up into the heavens and they were all looking up in the sky like this. And suddenly there were two white robed men standing there. And they said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Right there in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 11, we have the doctrine of the second coming. It was given by the mouth of these angels, and they said, just as you see him ascend, you will someday see him descend. And that's the faith that we still cling to today. And then as the as their life together went on, they decided, Peter got up and said, you know, we were supposed to have 12. And you have to understand that 12 was an important number in Judaism. Numbers have a great significance. And now that Judas had, we believe, hanged himself in his remorse over having uh, uh, been a part of Christ's death and crucifixion, uh, he said, we need to find somebody else to do this. And they were uh, meeting together and they were, it says in scripture, constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and several other women, and the brothers of Jesus, the physical brothers, Mary's other children, after Jesus happened. That's interesting because while he was alive, they didn't believe in him. He was just their older brother who was carpenter like they were. It wasn't until they were convinced and Jesus appeared to them and they were able to touch him, speak with him, visibly apprehend him, that they became absolute believers. And here they are. And so uh, Peter said, we need to find someone to replace Judas. And he says, this was written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate and no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. He got that from Psalm 109, verse 8. And, you know, it's interesting to note how much these the early church disciples saw the book of Psalms as prophetic utterances. There are many references in the Psalms to the life of Jesus. Jesus quoted from many of the Psalms, even on the cross, while he was being tortured, and while he was suffering great agony, he quoted from the Psalms. So Peter says, we've got to choose a replacement. And so they decide to cast lots. And most scholars think that the way this was done, they nominated people and wrote their names on stones that they put in some kind of receptacle. And then they would shake them up and allow just one stone to be poured out. And whichever stone came out, that was the one. They chose two in this case, and they had only two stones. They nominated two. Joseph, who was also called Barsabbas, known as Justice, and Matthias, Justice and Matthias. And they prayed, said, Lord, both of these men were with Jesus. The qualifications, they had to have been with Jesus from the beginning with the other 12. Now, they weren't chosen as the 12, but they were part of the group, the covey of disciples that moved around with Jesus and they observed him, heard all of his teaching. And those two were nominated, but they weren't sure which one the Holy Spirit wanted. So they were going to allow God to make that choice by catching up. And this was fairly common in the Jewish tradition. They used Urim and Thummim to discern the mind of God often. We're not certain what Urim and Thummim was, whether it was sticks that were thrown on the ground and and interpreted in a certain way. Nobody knows for certain. But we kind of pretty much know that they would write the names on the stones and then shake them up, and then whichever one came out, they would be chosen by lot that they believed that God would, would superintend that choice. So that's what happened, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was enrolled 
with the twelve. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Matthias because the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot. There are some traditions. One of those traditions, he went to minister to a group of cannibals in uh, what is now the region of Georgia in Russia. And uh, whether that's the case or not, there's much speculation. And in some of the apocryphal books and literature, which was not selected as canon, there are some fantastical stories, which I can see very well, uh, shouldn't have been included in the canon because they are uh, beyond bizarre. And I don't need to go into that because that's not the word of God. And our purpose is here is to, is to bring out the truths from scripture that might help us to grow. So we need a sequential understanding of the knowledge of how these things happened 2,000 years ago. We need to extract from that uh, universal, timeless principles that we can adopt for ourselves and will help us grow in our faith to become all that God has called us to be. So that pretty much ends chapter one. Matthias is selected. Now, next Sunday will be, the next Sunday after you see this, will be Pentecost Sunday. And so that'll put us right in chapter two of Acts. Now, chapter two uh, describes the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I do believe, and I will probably repeat this next week, that the church has not given enough emphasis, enough celebration of the day of Pentecost. We kind of stick it off over here. Yeah, it happened. Maybe we have a picnic about it, which is nothing wrong with a picnic, but but perhaps next to Easter, it ought to be the second most important memorable day in Christianity because it's when the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, who is a person, not an it, not a force, not an influence, one God, three persons. We know about Jesus coming. We've read and learned all about the Father, how he gave the Ten Commandments and instructed the patriarchs of old. And now the third person. For some of us, he's a mysterious non-entity, but he is the person of God who is now with us and by invitation has indwelt us and by consideration will clothe us, baptize us with the power we need to be effective witnesses of who Jesus was and is and will be to us who follow him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message today. I ask, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to fully comprehend who you are as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we're beginning this study in the book of Acts, and, and next Sunday we're going to talk about the momentous Pentecost, 50 days, how your first disciples were told to wait and remain in Jerusalem until they received a gift, this great gift of the third person of God who would come and remain with us, Lord. We are told not to quench the Holy Spirit. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit, Lord. May we do neither in our walk with you ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear calling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he
Thank you to shine like the sun.